Okay. Well, first, we'd like to thank everybody for attending our, our panel today. Uh, as you saw from the topic area, cybersecurity, operational technology, IT. And so I thought I'd give you just kind of a, a background uh, of why we found that important here at Capital Technology University. So we do have uh, folks on campus that have construction backgrounds. I came from industrial construction and we have uh, great cybersecurity here. Dr. Butler, as you see, runs that whole center. And from the background experience that we, we both were talking about, um, I found that nobody was really dedicated to operational technology. And as we work with folks like Diane and, and Ian to determine what area, uh, because it's a dynamic area, critical infrastructure is huge. And working with the DHS and the 16 sectors, uh, one of the common threads that we talked about was operational technology. It affects the facilities in the critical infrastructure. So whether it's a refinery, power plant, wastewater treatment facility, manufacturing facility, they all use operational technology. And so the, the operational technology is, is what turns devices on and off, like a valve. So a common valve would be in all those type of facilities. And of course, historically, valves were operated manually, then they became pneumatically operated, and now they're operated operational technology, which means you can access and, and attack a valve through the internet, and IT, I, IOT gets in the, the facilities, you can turn a valve on and off the wrong time, it could potentially obviously blow up or stop the process of one of those major critical infrastructure facilities. And so even though critical infrastructure is a huge dynamic area that you can have many segments, this is what we wanted to talk about today of identifying what we think is, is one of the highly uh, needed areas for protection from cyber attacks and that's operational technology. And so I'd like to turn that over to Diane at this point. You're on mute, Diane, you're on mute. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you so much, Stephen, for the invitation for Capital Technology University and myself to participate in your event. I was so excited to read about the description because I really think that uh, this is an amazing lineup that you have. So the description this is where we fit in exactly is the Global Security Connection Virtual Conference and Exhibition. It's a three-day tour that you will that will lead you to discover security industries, most innovative companies and practitioners, and you get to meet and interact with people shaping the future of the security sector. And I really want to you know applaud Capital Technology University for them being innovative. In, in academia and recognizing the value of partnerships with industry and government and also in the global environment that we are. So as you heard from Dr. Sims, this world is just getting more and more complex. Uh, you heard from uh, Stephen in my bio. I'm currently with the National Security Agency and I also serve um, in a volunteer capacity for a Women in Cybersecurity Mid-Atlantic Affiliate as their president. So my, my life, professional and my personal life, is dedicated to this space. And what I really enjoy about the partnership between academia, government, and industry is, is that we're all rallying around a common denominator. And that common denominator is the critical infrastructure sector and how do we shore that up so that our lunch is not eaten. The risk is very, very real to the critical infrastructure sectors in the area of cybersecurity with both IT and OT. So recently, just a couple of, uh, actually about two weeks ago, General Nakasone, who is the director of the National Security Agency and also the commander of the U.S. Cyber Command, he spoke with the Defense News and he said, it, and it's not that we don't know this, I'm stating the obvious, but it is really true. The, the, what's going on today is that the, the sophistication of the threats are just increasing. The complexity of them are just increasing. And they're really learning how to attack us in a different way. And what the government's realizing is that we need to figure out who we can partner with and really put that connective tissue together. So one example that just came out, I think it was just, I read it just over the weekend, DARPA, who is the Defense uh, Innovation Think Tank, Re Research Think Tank, they're now working towards um, uh, a more secure type of hardware. 
and they're actually now doing it for the first time. They've never done this before. They're actually are paying for top hackers to try to attack their new generation of super secure hardware. They've never done that before, but they're now recognizing we need to work with folks that are very, very strong and with academia and moving forward. So they, they recognize that um, this, it, cybersecurity attacks in the critical infrastructure sector are both hardware and software. And as Dr. Sims mentioned, the OT area is ripe uh, for attack. And that is why the, uh, that surface is so important for us to kind of rally behind and, and really talk about what's going on in that space. So that is the, as a, as a community, we can pull up and really be stronger together. The system that DARPA is actually fo at, is, is suggested and asked for hackers to attack is their system security integration through hardware and firmware. They're trying to shore that up um, and use that across multiple sectors. That would include the number of sectors that there are they're in. So the reason why I just share those two things between like Sony and DARPA is because the partnerships and the nation's strength is in that space. Cybersecurity um, and, and critical infrastructure uh, for the United States, you know, is a national security threat and an economic security threat. So that is very real. So all of us actually want to be more secure. The very you think about the makings of the of our country of the united states of america we're coming together so we're stronger together and so we all want to have a fair playing field right you work hard you build a business you play hard well the cybersecurity is really just undermining the integrity of our systems so this is why what we're doing here is so important this is why i love the field of cybersecurity and i just thought i would might before i turn it over to um, my colleagues uh, dr mcandrew who's going to be talking about the industry and the international perspective um, and dr butler who's going to be talking about innovation in um in academia I just thought I'd mention what exactly are the critical infrastructure sectors, if you don't already know that, just real briefly, so that will tie it naturally in and be able to, be able to turn it over to my colleagues. So we really came more into um, awareness, I think, and more of a forefront as a result of the coronavirus. As a result of the coronavirus, we all know that emergency workers um, and industries were permitted to continue to work. So that started people, oh, which, where do you work? Oh, I work for the electrical company. Oh, where do you work? I do uh, some manufacturing. Where do you work? You work in the healthcare. So then you started thinking, oh, those are all the critical infrastructure sectors. So it really, it really had a big spotlight put on that space. So that space is 16 crit into the United States that is identified by the Department of Homeland Security, um, the so Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, CIS is a new sub-agency with the Department of Homeland Security. The definition for those is assets, systems, and networks, whether virtual or physical, considered to be so vital to the United States that their incapacitation or destruction would have a deliberating, I'm sorry, debilitating effect on security, national economic security, national public health or safety, or any combination thereof. So that's pretty, it's a pretty high bar, but there is a lot that we rest upon our very, you know, the American way of life rests upon these 16 sectors working, uh, working well. And all of them are subject to cybersecurity threats, which is why I applaud, um, uh, Capital Tech University to really embrace the education arena in this space to help prepare, you know, the workers going into these infra into these sectors. So real briefly, the six, six, 16 sectors, for those that may not have heard them called out in a list before, so you're, you're recognizing some, but some you may not realize were on there, uh, is the chemical sector, commercial facility sector, communication sector, critical manufacturing sector, and you heard that from Dr. Sims' background was in that space, a uh, dam sector, defense industrial based sector, which is where I spend a lot of my space, emergency services sector, energy sector, and that affects all of us. Uh, we're getting more and more in tune of what's going on in the cybersecurity threats to these energy sector, financial services sector, food and agriculture sector, government facilities, healthcare, IT actually has its own sector, uh, and nuclear reactors, material, and waste, transportation, and water and wastewater systems. So pretty significant. And what we're recognizing is not just the IT, it is the OT, and there's a, an emphasis there. And I think the, the, ni the nice part about this particular panel um, is that we're seeing who can we come together and be knitted more closely so that we're stronger together as, you know, as we rise up. So with this risk being now global, uh, the sense of urgency really being there, um, 
just real briefly on the government perspective, they're recognizing that we don't want to stifle innovation. And that's why I like that's the, uh, the description of today's conference, right? It's security, discover the security industries with most innovative companies and practitioners. So in the area of cybersecurity, uh, OT, what the government's looking at is saying, hey, this space is so agile, we don't want to regulate. We want to actually promote innovation. We want to promote partnerships. Let's see where this can take us so that there's agility and together we're, we're stronger. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. McAndrew, who's got a really interesting perspective. Um, and he also has some experience on the manufacturing side. And then um, with, to him, we'll follow uh, Dr. Butler. So thanks again. Well, oh, thank you for that part. And um, thank you for your introduction. As was introduced before, my name is Ian McAndrew. I'm the Dean of the Doctoral Programs. But what I want to do is try, try to take a little bit of a sort of a step back approach in thinking about the problem. Now, we've already mentioned critical infrastructure and cybersecurity, and it doesn't take much energy or effort to realize the importance and the interrelationship of them. But we're also in this stage where we're talking about information technology versus operational technology. And I often believe and like the phrase that history repeats itself, and I want to think a little bit about that and think where we are and how it brings together. Now, manufacturing is a key thing. And we hear about that in many ways. And it is a key thing. And if we think about it, you know, using some of the phrases that have been said before, some of the initiatives that are happening with the, the virus and everything like that, and talk about making things more again in America. I'd like to start with this phrase, you know, manufacturing is coming home. Globally, and from a global perspective, manufacturing in its modern environment now started really with the likes of Henry Ford at the beginning of the 1900s. We had the experts like Hawthorne and we had the scientific management and started on manufacturing and it became an instant success in how it achieved and what it did. Now, manufacturing in some ways, and if we focus on the effect of assembly, it is critical, but it's always been seen as the poor relative. And people look at other things and think about things in the biggest perspective. Just a little fact here. In the Second World War, when Britain was fighting the Germany in the Battle of Britain with our Spitfires and Hurricanes and Lancaster bomb, those engines were manufactured by Rolls-Royce. But what a lot of people don't realize is that Ford Motor Company got involved in manufacturing Rolls-Royce engines. And they produced more Rolls-Royce engines in the Second World War than Rolls-Royce themselves. That assembly technique is critical to any successful industry and country and sector. And manufacturing, if we can think about that and think about the assembly and the implications it has. Now, my background was as a mechanical engineer, and this was in the 1980s in manufacturing in Ford Motor Company, actually. And robots came along and I studied and became a professional engineer in electrical and electronic engineering and then programming. And then robots came in. And robots started to do things like pick and place exercises. And across the whole of America and Europe, manufacturing and the assembly became very expensive. And it became expensive as robots became more useful. Now often, they replaced humans, or operators on the production line, and they could do some very good jobs. But then they reached this phase where robots or the use of them became popular rather than important. Now, there's a reason why I'm going in this direction, and please help me out, because I'm trying to focus where we are and how we're dealing with operational technology and how it's the future being based on what we're doing in the past. Now, about 20 odd years ago, we know the story. We know what happened. Manufacturing was heavily distributed globally. It went to South America. It went to China. It went to other parts of the world, including India. It's not uncommon, and as I was told once when I was a young engineer, you know, you look out of the window of an office in America, in Detroit, in the early 70s, you would struggle to find a car that wasn't designed and made in America. You look out of the window now, and you'll be looking for the American cars as well as the other cars. There's been a huge shift in what's happening. Now, as manufacturing has become more advanced and more expensive, it has gone to other parts of the world where it's cheaper to do things without computers. It's cheaper to use operators. 
And we now have a situation where manufacturing is divided into two areas, those without technology and those with technology. And trying to compete in areas where costs are a lot cheaper sometimes is very difficult, but it is achievable. And let's think of the example for those of you that are into photography. The German manufacturer Leica of cameras, superb gold standard of cameras. They are one of the very few camera operators outside of Asia and Japan that are successful. And what they do is high end quality work and they do it very well. Think about all the manufacturing that is distributed from America globally. If that comes back, a lot of that will be high volume work. Now, the important thing is, how do we bring all that together? And what does it do relating to what we're discussing today? As I said a few minutes ago, manufacturing was seen as the little brother, the poor relative of everything we're doing. Why would people bother to spy on manufacturing and different things like that? And again, let's go back. It was a very successful plane around the Korean War time called the F-86 Sabre. Very, very successful American fighter plane. A jet plane. Then, a little while afterwards, the Soviets brought out their MiG-17. And if you're not familiar and you're interested, Google pictures and you can see it is very, very identical. People were still in designs years ago. That's where the espionage, the interest and the threat to companies was from. Still in the design, still in the operational and how it would be made, the success and the technology. Now, manufacturing was never that advanced and therefore people didn't bother doing that. If we had the designs of anything, we could decide how to make it. That's not true anymore. If we look at some of the processes and we look at the aviation industry, and if we look at the Dreamliner, the way that they manufacture fibrous composites for very complicated parts of the plane, for example, where the wheels are in the center and those geometrical patterns, how it hocks around the actual root of the wing itself. They are industrial secrets how they're manufactured and there are many of those. Most engines or jet engines, they have top secrets of how they actually manufacture the turbine blade to be a single grain and very very effective. Manufacturing is now a very focused target where people haven't quite yet started looking at it but if they're not soon they will very soon because there is technology to be found there. Now, when we started using robots and automation, we would have what was known as programmable logic controllers. It was an industrial computer which really operated the movement and processing of robot arms and conveyors that everything came together. Now we need to link those to computers. We need to link those computers then to systems. We need to link those to the operational order level and the maintenance and the cells and everything else like that, where we had robots that were working on their own as a standalone PLC, they are now part of a big system. As technology evolves and becomes more and more complicated and integrated, those standalone PCs operate with numerous input output devices and where we have an input and where we have an output, we have a security risk. If we have a security risk, we have an access problem. Now think about this, and we were all familiar with examples that if someone was to break into maybe a critical infrastructure of a dam, for example, a hydroelectric dam in the northwest of America, someone could switch it on, switch it off, make water pass, not electricity, and yes, it can cause very big problems. But let's think about that, that remote access in manufacturing. That's the remote access now, and that's the remote access in the future. Now let's look, for example, at a classic case. We have robots doing very complicated assembly processes now. And again, where if, if it went wrong, a maintainer would come from the stores or the maintenance area with their laptop and they'd program in, they'd look for the error, maybe diagnose that there's a sensor problem or there's some minor fault and they would correct that. And then the machine would carry on using. That doesn't happen anymore. People buy turnkey systems. They will buy a complete sub-assembly with robots and programmable controllers and devices and machines that all integrate. And they will expect that company to maintain that for them. 
Now that company won't have people on site normally, but they will access it remotely. They will access that robot remotely. And if mechanical work is to be done, they will inform the people that need to do that work at that site. Now think of where we are. We have very, very expensive manufacturing processes with advanced equipment that is being controlled by people on a computer or a laptop, the other side of the world. And these are controlling devices, not just data going in and out, but mechanical things that are moving around. Large robots, large machines that can do a lot of damage if they're wrong. And you think of that remote access, if we ignore it, and as we add to it with the Internet of Things, it becomes a target. Manufacturing is a target on many levels. And the threat may not just be competition, it may be foreign governments, it may be mad people, employees that have left the company and feel dissatisfied. It is possible if we do not make sure that this is secure, that manufacturing could be accessed on the other side of the world, a robot arm could be programmed to swing around and break all of the jigs, the fixtures, the products and everything themselves and stop that manufacturing line for what could be months if they did the right type of damage. And that as the Internet of Things controls all of the systems and they could do it all at once like an orchestra and all of the robot machines could go mad for want of a better phrase and be swinging around with parts and damaging everything. You could destroy a company overnight by access, accessing its robots. This is something, and this is where operational technology fits in. It's not information technology. It's not cybersecurity. It's not critical infrastructure. It's linking all of those together. As 15, 20, 30 years ago, the phrase cybersecurity started to become more and more important as we had the internet and the data communications and data transfer. I believe we're at the dawn now where operational technology needs to be molded. It needs to be directed. In this particular case, I'm just looking at manufacturing and assembly. As already mentioned, there are 16 critical infrastructures. And in that, we don't see really a list of car manufacturers or aviation manufacturers. But you think we've even designed things differently now. Years ago, there will be something called a hardwired emergency stop. There were wires that went into a system. 20 years ago, because of technology, we removed hardwired emergency stop and it's a push button with software in many cases. Imagine if someone actually then overrode those emergency stops or they, the electronic fuse that's supposed to trip, they bypass that. You could burn out equipment, you could burn everything out. You could access warehouses and ship the wrong components to the wrong places. You could access um, inspection stations in manufacturing and you could label good parts bad and bad parts good. Just think for the moment, if a part that had been rejected as bad and not safe was classified as good and then it goes to go bolt on a brake system on your car or some important system on your aircraft that you're flying on, there's a delay there. We wouldn't even know about it. We could be sabotaged without even thinking about it. An operational technology does need to be given a seat at the top table. It is one of those phrases, how do you describe operational technology? It's not as clear as some of the other industries and there's some of the other sectors and things that we've been focusing on. But I believe that if we start applying that to everywhere, it is going to become important. It's going to grow in importance. And many people have recognized that importance. And bringing that together in terms of education, industry and critical infrastructure is very, very important. And I would try to sort of summarize what I'm trying to say is we need three things, education, education and education. We need to bring industry, government, defense, all these sectors together. We need to recognize what are the skills that are lacking? What are the skills that we can add to people to make them really aware and experts in operational technology? It is recognized, but in my opinion, it's not recognized enough. We can do this and as manufacturing jobs will be brought back into the country, advanced manufacturing work undertaken. Let's do it right. Let's make it secure. Let's make it robust and let's give it the equal importance that it needs. We need to bring skill sets together and that is operational technology. You need many skills in many areas, some more than others, 
but that depends on the application. Now, with that in mind, I'd like to stop here and I'm going to hand you over to Dr. William Butler, who will be taking this afterwards. And if I just thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Dr. McAndrew. And uh, thank you, Diane. Uh, gave me a lot of segues into what I'm going to talk about today, and I'll uh, try to keep it within the time frame. So the first thing is uh, academics always give quizzes. So what, what, are the, <laughs> what are the 16 sectors? And what are the two types of manufacturing? I'm just kidding. We're not going to give you a quiz today. Um, but as, a, as a, I run the cybersecurity program at Capital, and one of the things uh, we do in cybersecurity is figure out what, is, what, what am I trying to protect? And uh, so I went to IEEE to look at what is the definition of what we're talking about today, just to set the table. So this is the only thing I'm going to read today. Uh, the Internet of Things refers to systems that include computation, sensing, communication, and actuation. IoT involves the connection between humans non-human physical objects and cyber objects enabling monitoring automation and decision making that's a lot of functionality that covers almost anything from a smart pill drop in your body to uh, to uh, um, to to a sense structure or sensor built into a bridge we're talking everything in between so uh that's the problem that we have in academia today to set it up um to frame the problem we have to integrate uh, operational technology networks and IT networks, uh, which increases the attack surface, which is what we say uh, all the different ways that the bad guys can get in. We just increase the level of complexity of uh, t t tens of hundreds of fold for cyber defenders. Um, so how do we uh, operate it, maintain it, secure it in an enterprise network? Because now my IT network is connected to an OT network. And my, uh, my staff in the operations center, the 24 by 7 center, have just gotten a larger headache because now uh, most of us in the IT world don't quite understand OT devices, how they work. Our risk management framework, which focuses on confidentiality, integrity, and availability, uh, that has been flipped now. Um, uh, these devices are designed to be available. So uh, availability is number one for these devices. They have to be, they have to continue to run. These devices are installed to run until they die. Uh, they're not designed uh, to be, password changes are not a simple thing. Uh, encryption is not a simple thing. Uh, it's hard. <laughs> like uh, Von Clausewitz said, uh, everything in war is hard. So, uh, and I would apply this to the OT problem. So that's what we have um, facing us today as educators. So we got to break some glass. Um, we have to um, attack this in a holistic manner. We've got to join engineering, computer science, uh, manufacturing. You kind of see some of that already, some of the new degrees, mechatronics, for an example. I can kind of see that we are integrating uh, what we do in the way we teach. We've got to break some walls down. We've got to have hybrid courses. We've got to bring students together earlier. Uh, because we've got to start uh, to design. These devices have been out there a long time uh, before we even thought about security. It's uh, very hard to retrofit OT de IT devices. Probably you can. OT devices, huge problem for us. So uh, we kind of lost a bubble on that, but the new devices that are being designed, we are talking to engineers um, to tell them about cybersecurity, about, uh, as Dr. McAndrew said, it's not all cyber, it's for physical. I always tell my students, uh, what's the point in having a, a great firewall if you leave the door open, they, they can walk out with your server. So you got to think about physical security, administrative, the whole series of securities have to be applied here. So we're, um, we're also challenged, we already have a shortfall of, of cybersecurity workers, hundreds of thousands. Now the OT on top of that, that just exacerbated my problem. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta increase. We gotta increase the output of uh, students that understand how to secure devices, how to secure networks. Uh, there is an entire ecosystem for operational technology that I'll talk about toward the end that we got to face. So uh, some of the things. So we have a shortfall in numbers, a shortfall in skills. So how can we tackle this? Academia. I've already said we gotta break down the stovepipes. We gotta break some glass. We gotta start talking to each other. Um, the engineers have a lot to do with this, that they design things. Uh, the computer science majors, they write the software. In some cases, the software is even more important, as Dr. McAndrew said. 
if I can slip a bug into your code, um, you know, I can ruin a whole line of Jaguars, you know, which would probably upset a lot of people around the Manhattan area. Uh, there's a lot of damage you can do with software. The the uh, the recent problem we had with Boeing, um, they grounded the entire fleet of jets because of software. Software runs everything. It, you you may not be able to drive your car if the OS has to reboot. I mean, it's getting to that point. So uh, one 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 of the researchers I read, he wanted to uh, in the uh, in the found in the um, security objectives was to add uh, software verification. Uh, not only look at confidentiality, availability, uh, integrity, uh, um, non-repudiation, and strong authentication, but uh, software verification because it's becoming so important that we need to start to teach that. So what can we do um, together uh, to tackle the issue, this, this manpower issue that we have coming up? So we, we talked about already that government and academia there are certain agencies that we work with a lot, uh, National Science Foundation for one, uh, trying to build centers of excellence uh, in many areas. They, they think forward. You got a forward thinking area, um, uh, idea that will fund it. Uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security, critical infrastructure is their thing. Uh, they have a certain set of universities that they work with. And of course, NSA. Um, we work a lot with them. Uh, uh, we uh, institutions work together too. We work with Morgan State University uh, with their engineers on anti tampering of devices, boards, and uh, CPUs. That's very that's their thing. We work on the uh, securing the network around the device. They work on securing the device itself. Again, if a adversary can get physical access uh, uh, to, to your facility and to the controls, uh, you're lost pretty much your loss so we have to work on all the layering of security it still applies in critical infrastructure but uh the devices is what's going to be different so we have a government um industry and academia uh i would suggest that if you are industry um open up some internships in the summer introduce our students to operational technology uh sh show us uh get us some internships in nuclear power plants and and the the, the major dam and water systems are uh, Areas we don't in the election system. I <laughs> get volunteer students to work. Uh, just listen, my home state of Georgia had a huge problem uh, with the uh, voting machines yesterday. Um, and I, I can't help but think uh, some smart college students probably could have. They, some of the workers, they, and it's not entirely their fault, they didn't know how to turn the machines on because they had to do it remotely. They had to train over Zoom probably. So our, our students could have figured it out, right? So we, we can definitely help uh, putting students in those positions to learn about critical infrastructure while they're undergraduates and they can start to build that expertise. The uh, trainers, give us your people, uh, give us training um, uh, mock-ups of your systems. Uh, give, give, give us some desktop uh, mock-ups of your control systems, um, uh, your heating systems, your dam systems, your electrical systems. Uh, give that to students early. Uh, give, give us the same training system you use for your own employees and also lend, lend your employees and their expertise uh, to a university. Uh, the best professor I ever had was a was a, an IBM uh, scientist on loan. We actually built a computer over an entire year. That, I, that's the, about the only course I remember because <laughs> it was so fun because we we're doing something with someone that had that spark in their eye that really loved what they were doing. And it transferred to us, and I, I just uh, encourage you, uh, uh, if you have lend your, you don't have to lend your people uh, for a year, just a few hours a week. Um, our students love it, so and it will help to uh, introduce them to your world. Now we'll get to um, the education we talked about: existing employees in critical infrastructure. They've got to learn about IT, and how are they going to do it? Um, well. Your partnership with a university will ensure that training programs can be put together where your existing workforce can either take a on-site training course, come to the university and learn about IT because it's coming. Once these networks are connected, um, uh, we're only as weak, as strong as our weakest link. If the OT network is weak or the IT network is weak, we're all at risk. So everyone needs to understand how to secure these networks and devices. So it is so these training programs retool your people along with these college graduates who understand IT and will slowly get more exposed to operational technology. 
Um, some some of the things I'm, I'm wrapping up with the market. We we got 5G networks are coming, and what does this mean? It means uh, always connected. Always connected means you're always exposed. This is not back in the AOL days where I was only exposed while I was dialed up. Those days are gone. So we are always exposed to the adversary, and 5G networks and operational technology goes hand in hand because now I don't have to build a physical network. I just have to put a little communications, um, build communications capability in that little sensor, throw it out there, and uh, it will connect to 5G and I forget about it, right? Uh, until it runs out of power, right? <laughs> so one of the limitations of OT devices. Um, so we have 5G coming. So we're teaching students about how to secure devices communications wise, uh, especially encryption and strong authentication. Uh, we're looking at big data. We're all uh, drowning in data. These sensors sense all day. Uh, they transfer data over the network to a, some sort of cloud-based database. So students have got to, un and your existing workers have got to understand uh, big data and how they can take advantage of the information that can be mined uh, from the big data to determine um, how well you're doing on the factory floor to are we under attack. Um, and, and of course, cloud computing. Uh, cloud computing, very important. As Dr. McAndrew said, um, we are a connected world. This is a global economy. Uh, we transmit uh, intellectual property. We send parts to be assembled in the final assembly through the uh, mail system. Everything is connected. So understanding the cloud and the way it works is very important and how to secure it. Uh, so those are the components of the ecosystem. Uh, the devices themselves, as it, there, are, there are five parts here, and I stole this from IEEE, by the way. Um, the, the gateways, because devices, these smart devices tend to call home, that's not a good security thing, is it? Uh, even the smart devices in your house are calling to some server that the manufacturer has set up. So when you put a gateway in your home, you make those devices come, come through your gateway. So that gives us a way to secure the, the communications leaving your facility. So that's one of the principles that we're, we're trying to, uh, to, to teach is that don't let your devices talk to anybody they want. Uh, actually uh, uh, force the issue, make them go through some a secure box uh, that you have control of. So we have the wireless networks. We're talking 5G. They're already talking about 6G. Can you imagine that? Uh, so we're even we're going to be even more connected uh, in, in ways you can't even imagine. So we've constantly got to talk about networks and communications. And of course, we go back to big data analytics. We designed the program Cyber Analytics because our data is so much data. Um, uh, no human can keep up. We, we've acknowledged that. So we've got to all have basic analytic skills to be able to mine the data and figure out, am I under attack or was I already attacked or am I secure? You know, they always say there's two types of networks, one that's been breached and one that they don't know they've been breached. Um, I'm not quite that pe pessimistic, but, you know, that's what I always hear all the time. So. And the last part is the applicate got to secure applications no matter where that application lives whether it's on a server on an ot device or in the cloud we must secure our applications and blockchain and other technologies are a way to assure that that software that i'm downloading from github is the software that diane wrote in her shop how do i uh, figure that out well we've got to figure out a way to certify that software is original and that when it makes its way across the internet or across the cloud, that that software that you download is a software that that programmer programmed and not some fake or some malicious software hiding inside of it, a Trojan horse. So in, in summary, uh, we've got to break glass within academia and start working together across departmentals. Uh, we've got to partner with industry. We've got to partner with government. We, we all got to partner together. This is one thing that's going to for force us to work together like COVID-19 kind of forced some things to happen in our digital transformation. Uh, people say we compress maybe three or four years into two months is what I've been hearing. Uh, this is having that same effect. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that, that I think that we, we touched on clearly was the dynamic of connecting folks to across disciplines. Right. So in, in, if we go back to the specifics of operational technology and IT, operational technology focus is running that piece of equipment no matter what. IT is about saving data. 
And so many folks come from one discipline or the other. So if you're maybe trained just in IT or cybersecurity, the odds of you ever seeing something like a 36 inch valve working on an industrial site is probably small. And then the opposite's true for those folks who are working in the facility who have no IT or cybersecurity background aren't understanding what's going on through the control room and what they're trying to do. And so it, it's today's market, we're trying to work with people and we're lucky here at Capital Tech that we're, we're in the, the DC region. So we have lots of uh, companies uh, that we can partner with and, and information and, and specific expertise that we can access quickly. But it's about bringing those distinct folks with different disciplines together to solve these problems, especially for us. All of us here in this panel are concerned about critical infrastructure and, and uh, we don't want the systems to fall down. I mean, uh, you know, a foreign attack from a foreign government can access the OT much easier than they can actually go to that facility physically and attack it in the States. And so that's why this whole focus for us is around that, that type of technology. So I see Diane's got her mic off. Do you want to? Uh, sure. Yeah. I was just, thank you, uh, Brad. So I, I just wanted to, you know, foot stomp that. So I think what we've heard today um, is that well, Dr. Butler mentioned, you know, the biggest change with OT is the number one requirement for availability. And then we heard from Dr. McAndrew about, you know, the attack surface is just, you know, increased dramatically. And then we also heard that, you know, OT is now going to have a seat at the table uh, from and then uh, Dr. Butler added, but just with a larger headache. So lots of changes in this space. Watch this space for sure, and I think it's going to force some changes. I did just want to mention that um, if you haven't seen it yet, the FireEye Mandiant report, the M Trends 2020, uh, it talks about the different changes in the different sectors, uh, but the last 15 years. The report that just came out. This is goes along with what my colleagues have said. Uh, this year alone, 22% of attacks had data theft of IP or espionage goals. So that that is real, right? That is really real, what you've been hearing from my colleagues. Um, you know, we went back to you know, World War II. You had the, heard the example there, but it's gone forward and just, you know, really hot to trot because it's expensive. And if you can get and steal it, you, you're all better off. Well, you know, we don't like that, do we? Um, and then also, real briefly, uh, it moved up from number eight last year, the, uh, the top targets. The top five, the, the fifth top target is construction and engineering. So this really is, everyone's looking at it, a lot of space in there. So um, they're above high tech. So uh, construction and engineering is above high tech, if you can imagine that. So that is where the ticket is in terms of um, the commercial IP that's, you know, really uh, valuable. And so I just wanted, to, uh, just wanted to end on, I'll give it the last comments to my colleagues, was this area is complex. But I just have a lot of hope. I just really do. The students, the, uh, the students that we're seeing, the youth of today love complexity. They don't shy away from it. They love interdisciplinary nature of things. They like to see how things fit together. You know, they may enjoy music and drawing, and then they may enjoy the hands-on things and the math. And they love the different complexity of it. So this field is ripe for those students growing up today. And I just think that with innovative in academic institutions and the partnerships that are out there, we can make a difference and I think that we will. So thank you so much. Thanks, Diane. Uh, Dr. McAndrew, any final comment? I think we're at the dawn of an exciting opportunity and answering one of the questions. The beauty about operational technology is we're working with some more constrained conditions and for example you know if we just go to a classic robot or how uh, a hydroelectric dam system works there are predictable and expected outcomes and we have the opportunity to model against those and look for discrepancies on a much smaller scale than we do with classical cyber but i would just follow on what diane was saying was the fact that the actual surface area of attack is enormous people have ignored it and once they start focusing on it, we're going to be potentially very vulnerable. Let's start early, let's stop it, and let's make it safe now. Thanks, Dr. McAndrew. Well, we appreciate everybody attending our panel presentation, and uh, I guess we're going to the uh, lounge, and so some of you we may see there. Thank you. <laughs>